Okay, so we've gone through very early theorists, uh, Freud and Adler and companions, uh, colleagues. Um, and we're kind of moving on to the next set of theorists. And a lot of the theorists we're going to be talking about, they don't say that a lot of their concepts are rooted in existentialism, but if you're a fan of existentialism, you'll probably be able to see how they're connected and how there are similarities. Um, this is my favorite theory. Uh, it's what my prime, I would consider to be my primary theory. Um, I do a lot of writing about existentialism. Um, I don't only use it as a theory in counseling. It's a theory that I apply to my own life um, to find meaning and purpose in my own life, to try to be focused more in the present, to be present for other human beings that I'm with in that moment. And uh, I think it is a life-changing um, theory that uh, works well at uh, getting at deeper uh, issues. Uh, and um, it is not a short uh, term theory. It's not a brief theory. Um, a lot of the brief cognitive theories can be measured well, so there's a lot of research on them. However, um, one of the largest problems I found with those brief therapies is that, yes, they can identify and help clients to work through um, issues like uh, irrational thought processes, negative thinking, things like that. Uh, but um, they have a difficult time getting at deeper issues um, or the larger picture of life. And many times uh, therapists use um, a broad array of uh, brief therapies, but and they work, uh, but six months to a year later, uh, there's a lot of um, either recurring symptomology or deeper issues surfacing that they didn't actually address. Um, so I think every theory uh, has positives and negatives. Um, I think that existential theory can be uh, applied uh, to almost everybody's life. And if needed, it's a theory that you can incorporate other theories as time goes on. So uh, if I was talking about um, finding meaning and uh, dealing with regrets and things like that, um, I might incorporate maybe CBT or REBT uh, during a few sessions or even reality therapy or solution-focused therapy or narrative therapy. So it works well as a foundational theory, and you can incorporate other theories as time goes by. Uh, let's see. Um, so uh, there are uh, some supplemental readings. Um, one of them is uh, the definition for the ACA Encyclopedia of Counseling that me and a friend of mine wrote uh, for existentialism. And uh, just a nice brief outline. Um, the If you take my course on grief and loss, uh, we'll go... Uh, 
much deeper into not only existential ther theory, but um, uh, regret therapy, uh, which I developed with a colleague of mine based on existential uh, concepts. Um, I think everybody, every human being deals with grief and loss and it's part of our human condition. And uh, I think, I think when I was younger uh, and was just starting out as a therapist and as a school counselor, I didn't realize how much people were trying to process grief or loss or death anxiety. And, um, but when I was in a private practice or an agency or a school, um, it was something that was brought up regularly. And I ended up running grief and loss groups and things like that. And, uh, and I just think that there are a lot of human conditions that individuals don't realize um, how important they are uh, in our growth and um, our psychological well-being and how common they are in, in human beings' journey through life. Um, so... Uh, we can, um, we can talk about, uh, some of the early concepts first. Um, I think that, uh, the first thing we need to understand is that existentialism started as a philosophy, not as a psychological theory. Um, so the first names that I list in your notes are philosophers not psychologists, but I think it's important that, that you know these names. Um, I talk a little bit about them in uh, the encyclopedia uh, definition, um, but I'm not going to go into great detail into the philosophy, but it's important that you recognize these names. And uh, so when we think about the early philosophers like Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche and Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, uh, I think that one of the problems, if, if people don't like existentialism, it's because these early philosophers focused a lot on what we call nihilism or uh, basically meaninglessness. However, uh, the more recent existential philosophers like Martin Buber or Paul Tillich um, or even uh, the psychologists, um, yes, they, they addressed nihilism and death, anxiety and the existential vacuum, and, uh, but they didn't stop there they moved on and took that philosophy uh, forward to um, not only meaninglessness, but finding meaning and purpose in our lives. Uh, so I think that it kind of moves uh, or evolves uh, throughout uh, history and it progresses to probably one of the most positive philosophies that I know. Um, so when we talk about the psychologists, uh, they began um, applying a lot of the earlier philosophies to their psychological theories. And many of them studied these philosophies and the primary names for the psychologists uh, were Viktor Frankl and Rollo May, and uh, and a contemporary uh, psychologist, Irvin Yalom. I think 
all of these individuals have some really good books that are easy to read. They're little paperbacks, and uh, most of our students enjoy reading them. Viktor Frankl wrote Man's Search for Meaning, um, and uh, Urban Yalom has over a dozen books about what it's like being a therapist. Uh, uh, he wrote uh, The Gift of Therapy, Staring at the Sun, um, and a lot more. Um, his textbooks are a little uh, weighty um, and much larger, but uh, but his um, his nonfiction books about his personal experience as a therapist, um, students usually like reading them. So let's look at the background of some of these psychologists. And uh, we'll notice some connections with the psychologists. Um, so once again, Viktor Frankl. So he was born not in the 1800s, but 1905. Uh, and um, he was born in Vienna. So we have that aspect. He became a medical doctor in 1930, Ph.D., uh, in 1949 from Vienna. There's a there's um, 19 years difference between the MD and the PhD. And the reason for that is from 1942 to 1945, uh, he was a Jewish prisoner in uh, multiple Nazi concentration camps. Auschwitz, Stockau, uh, during World War II. Uh, most of his family was killed during World War II. Um, so in his book, which was published in 1946, only one year after World War II ended, uh, he talked about his experiences in the concentration camps. So the first half of his book is about his time in concentration camps. But the second part of his book is on logotherapy. Logo meaning word or healing through reason or talking. And uh, so the second part of the book describes his therapy. And uh, I think... Uh, I think it's a nice balance for for a book. Um, it talks about uh, how he found meaning in a hopeless environment, how that how he came to understand that even though he was in a concentration camp, he still could make personal choices, and. Uh, Perhaps the most important choice is how to react emotionally to any given situation. How to maintain one's meaning and purpose through uh, great struggles and obstacles. How to maintain one's uh, desire to live and thrive in a hopeless environment. I think that... Um, one of the things that he found while he was a prisoner, um, he noticed that, yes, there are a lot of people who died through violence, but he also saw that many people gave up hope and they had no meaning or purpose. And so they no longer had the will to live, the will to survive. And uh, they often did not make it out of a concentration camp. One of the things that uh, Viktor Frankl uh, found that gave his life meaning while being a prisoner was thinking about life and this theory. And he wanted to share these concepts with others to help others. And, uh, you know, he would write down these ideas on tiny little scraps of paper when he was a prisoner. And um, 
you know, I think that, uh, you know, he wrote this book in no time because in reality, he was thinking about it the whole time he was a prisoner. When we think about, uh, so Rollo May, he was born in 1909. He lived, so here we have a shift uh, in location. So we move from European philosophy and psychology, mainly focused around Vienna and, uh, and Paris. Um, and we move to the eastern uh, coast of America uh, in New York City and Boston. And those became the new uh, schools of thought and existentialism uh, really thrived in, uh, in New York and Boston and up and down the East Coast. And eventually, uh, the third school of thought was on in America on the West Coast in California. And, um, and a lot of these uh, theorists that we talk about uh, will end up in California. So those are the three schools of thought. And uh, when we think about Rollo May, so he lived about the same time period, but he had a very different life experience. Uh, he lived in Ohio and Michigan as a child. Um, he's given different reports about his life as a young person. Um, he uh, Sometimes he said he had a wonderful, caring family. Other times he said he had an unhappy home life. I guess it just depended on what mood he was in uh, or what he was going through at the time. Uh, he personally experienced two failed marriages. and But in his youth, he studied history, Greek civilization. I think he was on his own search for meaning. Uh, he later studied theology at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, so Union Theological Seminary, it's a Presbyterian seminary in New York City. It is connected um, with uh, Chicago University, uh, which began as a teacher's college and expanded from there. The interesting thing is that uh, Tillich, uh, one of the existential uh, philosophers and theologians, also taught at Union Theological Seminary, but um, I don't think their paths crossed. I think they were there at different times, but I'm sure there was an influence at the seminary, but um, he didn't stay there. He, he eventually went to study with Adler in Vienna. So here we have a literal con connection between the New York School of Existentialism and Adlerian psychology in Vienna. So when he was working on his doctorate, he suffered from tuberculosis for two years. And at that time, uh, a large percentage of people who caught tuberculosis died. So not only was it a difficult disease, uh, but uh, he came to terms with his own mortality. And remember, last week we talked about uh, psychologists and theorists and their brushes with their own mortality and possible deaths. And I think that really does reframe our thinking about life. Sometimes coming close to death or experiencing loss of other or the possible loss of self adds a different nuance to our living. It gives life kind of a, 
oh, I don't know the word, but it's like, I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to drift through life. It gives time while we're alive a more significant importance. And so while he was suffering from tuberculosis, uh, he started reading Freud and Kierkegaard and Tillich. And uh, so, uh, like I had mentioned, uh, well, his, fa his uh, most famous books are Love and Will, 1969, and uh, The Meaning of Anxiety, 1950. So I think those two theorists are probably uh, what we would consider uh, founders of the existential uh, psychological movement. Um, and uh, in the encyclopedia uh, excerpt that I included in the notes, um, it also talks about Irvin Yalom and the philosophers a little more, and you can read that on your own. So that's that's a little history with some of the people, but let's talk about the theory itself. So I think the philosophers and now the psychologists, they, they realize that most human beings at some point in their lives ask themselves, well, what's it mean to be a human being? And every human strives and struggles to better understand our human experience and our journey. So even from the very earliest philosophers, death has been contemplated and uh, it became one of the key aspects of existential theory. So the early individuals and philosophers focused on kind of the negativity of death and it added to the concept of meaninglessness. But um, as time moved on, death adds a poignancy to the time we have to live, uh, vitality to our existence. Because if we had no time limit, on our existence, uh, there would be no urgency. Uh, we could just take forever to do whatever we wanted to do. But because we have a limited time, uh, there's always in the back of our minds a, a sense of our own mortality and kind of a timeline. Uh, so the second thing that people usually realize is that in one sense, we are ultimately all alone. And I think that when we come to terms with that, uh, we experience what's called the existential vacuum. And uh, it, a vacuum is a concept of space or nothingness. And, uh, and so the early philosophers maintain that, uh, yes, we are all alone ultimately. But the later philosophers, they took this a step further. They say, yes, okay, so we experience this anxiety and uh, this meaninglessness, then why live? What's the point? So the later philosophers said, yes, but that's only the beginning. That gives us the start to explore why. So meaning can be found in life, in the process, 
in our journey rather than in the end product. I'm sure you've all seen uh, memes on Facebook uh, or other places that um, life is about the journey, not the destination. Um, I kind of like the idea of life being a dance. And if we think about it, if we're dancing with somebody, uh, we're not thinking about, oh, I want this song to end. You know, I want to get to the destination. We don't want the song to end if we're enjoying the person we are with. And so we enjoy the dance. And, uh, you know, I think all of that is about coming into the present, uh, being in the now. Um, if, if we focus on regrets from the past in our lives, we're thinking about the past, it often leads to depression. If we worry about the unknown or uh, what might happen in the future, uh, that often leads to anxiety. But if we're focused on the past or the future, we're not living in the present. And that's where we need to be. So the paradox is to find meaning in this existential vacuum of meaninglessness. And only we can decide what our personal meaning is, and that directs our journey in life. And sometimes we discover things along the way, and it adds to our meaning and experiences. So one of the, my favorite philosophers was a Jewish philosopher named Martin Buber. He wrote a book called I and Thou. That's just the old way of saying me and you. So if he wrote it today, he wrote a, write a book called Me and You. And uh, when we think about the I and thou experience, it takes the concept of the existential vacuum and being totally alone and expands upon it. So how do we find meaning if we're totally alone? Well, one of my favorite sayings from him is that there is no I without a thou. There is no me without a you. How do I become me if I don't interact with other? So through this experience of other, I grow as an individual. So he has three levels of the I thou experience. The first level is between human beings and nature. And the second level is, uh, so let's talk about that first level a little bit. When, when we think about a human being's relationship with nature, many times humans see nature as something uh, to use or to get resources from or to simply enjoy on a vacation. Um, uh, however, um, what Martin Buber is talking about is there's a difference between human beings who think, oh, you know, I'm the most advanced species on earth and, uh, you know, uh, nature is at my disposal. There's a big difference between that concept and feeling as though we are part of nature, equal to all other species. Um, I, I personally don't have any species loyalty. I don't think that a human being uh, has more worth or value than any other species. Uh, but that's kind of a rare take on life. Um, but feeling a part of nature, feeling a part of the larger uh, 
whole. Um, it's called universality. And uh, it creates a connection and belonging that uh, is much more meaningful. Um, I think, uh, so the second I thou experience is between two human beings, me and another human being. And when we think about this, we come into contact with some people. Right now, I'm in contact with each of you, uh, but I'm just up here talking and you're listening and maybe you'll participate. But I think it's very different um, when we begin to interact. How many interactions do you have with other people in your life, even if they're friends or family or coworkers? How many interactions do you have when that other person gives you their full attention? And you know they're not thinking about other things. They are present for you. You feel heard and you give them your full attention. And so two individuals experience one another and both leave that experience changed in some way as a result of that experience. And I think if you're a good therapist, if you're a good counselor, whatever good means, the most important factor is that you are present for your client, that they know that you're not thinking about what you have to do after the therapy session or you had a bad day before you got into work. You're only thinking about them and you and the interaction between the two of you. That's why it's so easy for me to say that I've truly grown just as much as my clients have grown as a result of therapy. I think if we enter into any relationship, whether it's a professional relationship or a more intimate relationship, I think that presence is what is lacking in modern day society. How many times do you sit at a table and somebody's looking at their phone? There are so many distractions that even the people who are closest to us are not fully present with us in our lives. Many times clients don't know how to react to that presence. When... Uh, when I was a therapist for about five years at an agency, um, I would do a lot of work with individuals about human sexuality and individuals who wanted sex changes, couples who would come in and have problems. Um, but I rarely talked about sexuality. Because if there was an issue with a couple, uh, the issue was normally intimacy, not sexuality. They were not present emotionally, cognitively for one another. Um, so we normally talked about communication, being present for one another, values in a relationship, what was truly important to one another, things like that. Um, the third level of the I-Thou experience is between you and whatever your belief system is. Atheism is also a belief system. Atheists believe that once we die, there is nothing more. But if you have another kind of belief system that relies on some kind of higher power or something beyond self, um, then you can have an interaction, uh, interaction uh, with that higher power. 
uh, an encounter with some divine entity. And that would be the third I thou experience. So I'd like each of you to think about what we call existential moments in our lives. Existential moments have to do with these themes in life that I just shared with you, whether it's realizing that we're not going to live forever, thinking about being part of nature or something larger than ourselves or feeling a part of a greater whole, um, being present for another human being in a relationship or some interaction with your own belief system if you have that type of belief system. It could be about finding meaning in your life or a purpose. Um, so I'm just going to share some personal examples with you um, about my own existential experiences. Uh, but yours may be totally different than my own. I'm sure they will be. But most of the time, they follow one of those themes. So, um, Let's see. My first experience I'll give has to do with um, nature. So when I was younger, I don't know, 13, maybe younger than that, um, parents were different back then. We, we had a lot of freedom. And I guess my parents thought that if I was out hiking on the Appalachian Trail or camping, I wasn't going to get in trouble, uh, like hanging out of my, with my friends in town. Um, so when I was very young, uh, in the summers, I would just go either with a friend or by myself out for a few weeks at a time. And we would hike and canoe or uh, camp. Uh, for extended periods of time. And one time I was, uh, I had made camp for the evening and uh, I just got my tent up and it started raining and the rain moved past and uh, a misty fog came into the campground and I really couldn't see very far in front of me. But I heard leaves rustling and uh, walking. And at first I was very nervous. I didn't know what was coming into the camp. Uh, but as, uh, as this entity walked through the mist, I realized that it was a large deer, a buck with antlers. And I think it was just as startled as I was, but it didn't bolt away because I was still and I just stared at it for a while. And eventually we both relaxed. I wasn't going to hurt it and uh, it wasn't going to harm me in any way. And we made eye contact for quite a while. And then eventually it moved on. But during that encounter, I felt that I was not separate from nature or my surroundings that I belonged as a part of the whole that was creation or nature. In that moment, I was totally living in the present, uh, not thinking about anything else, um, but when people experience moments of presence, time changes and we lose track of time because we're only living in the now. So if you have an artist and they start painting in the morning and they are immersed in creating their art, whether it is painting or music or writing, and they finish their project and they notice it is nighttime, it's dark outside. Where did the day go? 
There was no experience of time. There was only a constant now. And so the second experience I'll share with you has to do with life and death and uh, our relation to our own mortality. And uh, my father, I was born when he was in his 40s. And, um, and so he was always older than the other dads. And uh, so I always had a sense that I might lose him sooner than maybe a, my friend uh, would lose their parent. Um, but uh, I was going to Shippensburg University. I had a 1969 Volkswagen convertible, a bug, and uh, I was kind of an orangish red. I was listening to an AM radio and uh, listening to some classic rock station. It was uh, nearing the end of my time in undergrad, and uh, it was a bright, sunny spring day. And uh, back then, uh, when they would repair a road, all they did was throw down some tar and some stones. And though it filled the potholes, it was very slippery. I was probably driving too fast through those back roads and the car slid and it went over a dirt uh, embankment and was launched into the air and started rolling. And uh, I found myself sitting in the middle of a farmer's field. Uh, the radio was still playing because the AM radios were tied directly into the battery. And uh, it was like a bad movie. The wheel was slowly turning around and the car was a crumpled mess. There was nothing left of it. And I, found, I was sitting in the middle of this field. I had lost my shoes, lost my glasses. I was all bloody, probably in a little bit of shock. And I looked at the car and I said, wow, nobody could have survived that. And then I'm like, uh, I looked out over the fields and I saw all these beautiful yellow flowers blowing in the wind, rolling over the field. And uh, I realized as my eyes began to focus that they were a year's worth of my class notes taken on yellow legal paper but they no longer meant anything to me. And I just kind of enjoyed the scene. And uh, then I became a little anxious and I wondered if I was dead. Had I survived that crash? I don't know. And uh, my heart began to pound and uh, I wasn't sure what to do. But then I thought, wow, a second ago, you were enjoying this experience. Uh, you know, if you're if you're dead, you know, I guess that's OK. And I'm kind of going through this reasoning in my mind and uh, said, well, what's going to happen if you're dead? Well, somebody might stop and look at the wreck and if they ignore you. Well, then you're dead and you go on to see what happens next in this experience. You're okay now. And if you're alive, somebody will stop and talk to you and take you to the hospital. Either way, it was okay. And so kind of dealt with my fear of not only the mortality of other people I cared about, uh, but also my own mortality and uh, was able to live much more in the present after that, but, and, and without fear. But uh, obviously somebody stopped and talked to me and took me to the hospital, unless this is some cruel joke by some divine entity. And, uh, and I am still going on that uh, dreamlike journey. The, uh, Let's see. I'll give you a couple other examples. I've had a lot of um, spiritual examples, but I'm not going to share those with you. 
Um, and uh, his people are of all different belief systems. But let's see. An I thou moment between me and another human being uh, would be, uh, and I think this is uh, fairly common with human beings, is that uh, when I had each of my children, and I was in the hospital with my wife and uh, held that child for the very first time and held out a finger and a tiny little hand grasped that finger. Um, there was a few different realizations. The first realization is that they didn't really exist before. This is their first moment alive. Another experience or realization was that I truly knew what unconditional acceptance, love, and positive regard was at that time, that I accepted that new little human being fully, uh, without any conditions whatsoever. The third thing I realized is that, uh, you know, a personal sacrifice was uh, not that big of deal because I would probably sacrifice myself or anything else for the well-being of that child. Um, let's see. I had the same experience with newborn kittens, but it wasn't quite on the same level. Um, I guess the last thing would have to do with kind of the, an existential vacuum, but it's really like a meaning check-in at different times in my life. This has happened many, many times, but I never know when it's going to happen. Uh, so many times I'm sitting in a bar and I have to go to the restaurant, the restroom, and I wash my hands and I look into the mirror and it's as if time and space condense as I'm staring at myself in that mirror and I think about, wow, how'd you get here? Uh, where am I? This is your life right now. And uh, Talking Heads wrote a song about this. But, uh, but as I look at myself in the mirror, I identify with the feeling that I experience in that moment. Sometimes I'm not happy with where I'm at in life. And that tells me I need to make some personal changes. Sometimes I am very happy with where I'm at. That's a good check-in. Then I can enjoy the moment. Either way, after that existential experience, I usually dry my hands and go back and have another drink at the bar. But, uh, all right, those are my examples. So that's going to be your exercise for the discussion board. Think about some personal experiences you might feel comfortable sharing with the class, some personal existential experiences. So you might ask, all right, all of this is great philosophical banter, but how do we use this in therapy? Well, so there are not a lot of formal existential techniques. There's not a process of therapy. However, if we take basic dimensions of human existence or basic concepts that uh, we encounter on our own search for meaning, we address and process those with our clients. Many clients I talk with may be at different parts of their life journey. I talk with a lot of youngsters who have no direction and a lack of motivation. I think if they found some meaning, it would automatically provide some motivation. So many times people experience grief and loss. 
at different stages of their life. A lot of times people come in to see me because they're at a point in their life where it's kind of like midlife and they've strived to succeed and maybe they've gotten what they thought they should get or achieved what they think they should have achieved in their life up to that point. And yet there is still an emptiness within them. So even though they've got a great job and an education and a business and uh, have been promoted and made a lot of money and gotten a Porsche or, uh, you know, um, maybe uh, they become successful in other ways, maybe in sports, maybe whatever they were striving to be, they became. And yet they still found that uh, having physical possessions or money, which is really just an illusion with no value at all, uh, or perhaps they've had different or many relationships. And when people look at them, they are a model of success and achievement. And yet they feel empty, like they are still uh, not fulfilled, um, like something is missing in their lives. And they try a lot of different things to figure out how to fill that hole within themselves, but eventually they end up in counseling. And they discover that what they think they should have achieved doesn't actually provide meaning for them. It's what everybody told them to do. And they bought into that. But in reality, uh, it was not meaningful. And so we start over again to help them move further on the journey so that they might find meaning. It is personal discovery. Many times I meet people at the end of their lives in hospice or a hospital setting, and they look back on their lives and some people are content. They're happy with their lives. It was a great life. But other people find discontent and they have regrets and we begin to process that uh, using regret therapy and existentialism so that meaning can be found even at the end of their lives. So Corey outlines a few different uh, dimensions of the human condition, six different dimensions, and we can process these in therapy. First one is becoming self-aware, taking a good look at ourselves for who we truly are and where we find ourselves. Humans process freedom and responsibility. So even in a prison camp, people have some freedom People can take responsibility for their actions and choices. People have freedom to make certain choices, not every choice. Existential guilt is knowing that we have chosen not to choose or evaded a commitment. So we take a look at what we have freedom of choice, what that surrounds, what choices we've made, are we happy with them? Do we need to make some changes? This is going to sound very familiar when we talk about reality therapy or choice theory. Taking personal responsibility for where we are in our lives. The third one is that humans strive to create our own identity and to establish meaningful relationships with others. We begin to know ourselves through the experience of other. This takes the personal responsibility and the courage to be. So Tillich wrote a book called The Courage to Be. What does that mean, the courage to be? Courage to be authentic, to be who we truly are 
without changing ourselves to meet other people's expectations. Humans search for meaning and purpose, values and goals. Throughout the search, we continually grow, change and recreate ourselves. I personally have the philosophy that many clients say, I don't like who I am, I need to change. I need to become a better person. But in reality, I believe that each of us is born a perfect human being just as we are. It's like Mr. Rogers says, I like you just as you are. But often we try to meet other people's conditions of acceptance because they don't accept us fully for who we are unconditionally. And so we add things, we change things, we strive to be people we weren't originally. And so we pick up little pieces of baggage along our journey of life and uh, carry them with us. We become inauthentic. And so realizing that we are not who we truly are authentically or somebody else entirely, we need to let go of everything that we were not meant to be. And so by letting go of all that baggage, all the styles of clothing, all of the attitudes and bits of personality we added on to be accepted by others. If we let go of that and become who we truly are authentically, we get back to that original individual. So it's not changing who we are anymore. It's becoming who we always were authentically. Anxiety is a condition of life. Even if you think about happy things, weddings, graduation, buying a new house, whatever it might be, even those positive things, those life changes create anxiety. So anxiety is a condition of life because change is a condition of life, whether that change is a positive thing in our lives or something we wish we could avoid. Humans become aware of our own eventual death and importance is placed upon the life we are given. It doesn't really matter how long we live. What matters is how we lived in the time we were provided. Um, the goal of therapy is to enable the client to accept the awesome freedom of responsibility to act in order to live a more authentic life. Increased awareness leading to responsibility Responsible choices and new action is the central theme. Increased awareness of self and other also allows clients to discover new alternative possibilities and choices. The focus of therapy is always on the present and in the now. All right. Questions about existentialism. Comments. All right, that is the theory. And I'd like you to take some time for the exercise and kind of think about some existential moments in your life. And uh, don't forget to respond to the supplemental readings and uh, any other supplemental materials I might post. I know there's a video that's posted. I think it is uh, an interview with Rollo May. Uh, so please watch that. If it doesn't work, don't panic. Just tell me it didn't work. 
but uh, I got it working for me. Hopefully you will too. All right, I'm gonna stick around uh, for uh, whoever is doing the first presentation.